You know, opening lines are pretty important. So here are a few famous ones, and tell me who said them. Number one, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth, who was this? All right, good old Mr. Lincoln. Here's another one. And so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Anyone know? Kennedy, Kennedy very good. Okay, here's a third one. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. Martin Luther King. Okay, here's another one. I don't know, maybe only our history buffs among us will know this. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. This is all one sentence. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Churchill, very good. Okay, so those were some famous opening lines. And if I think about opening lines for chapel messages, if you're a chapel speaker, you're probably supposed to look like one of these images. And you're probably supposed to sound like, I'm so glad to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Wow, you are one good-looking crowd. But you know what I'm really thinking? I'm thinking things like, and looking like, maybe a turtle. I wish, honestly, I were almost any place but here right now. Next time, please consider inviting someone else to speak. <laughs> I suppose you're a good-looking crowd, but honestly, I'm not focusing on that. Those are probably not great opening lines, but they are honest ones. And maybe the one I should really be talking to about all this is God. You see, what do you do when you've got something to do, and you ask God what to do, and he's silent. How do you prepare a chapel message when God gives you nothing to say? What do you do when you ask, and you plead, and you study, and you pray, and you search the scriptures, and you pray some more, and you still come up empty-handed? What do you do when it seems like you've done all you can do, at least all you have the energy or the capacity to do, and the page is blank? Now, maybe some of you have already felt like this since the semester started, and it's only been three weeks. Maybe you've been thinking things like, Biola's not what you expected. You can't seem to find the right groove and balance for your classes and your schedule. The workload is not working. The funds are already looking slim. Roommates are not turning into BFFs. Old friends seem like they've changed. You're in a leadership position and wondering why you ever took it on. You're a senior, and so don't feel ready to graduate, and you're clueless about next steps. Whatever the situation, maybe you have prayed about this, maybe not. Maybe you've sought and asked for God's help and direction in some way, and you know what? God's not coming through with any answers. In fact, he's just downright silent, and there's no sign of him on the horizon. And don't even talk to me about finding joy in the middle of this. Did I mention that I once had a friend who gave me the nickname of Eeyore? And unfortunately, 
I signed up for a chapel talk from Philippians. And Philippians, authored by the Apostle Paul, just happens to use the word joy in its noun and verbal forms 16 times in the space of four chapters, which in my Bible is actually just three pages. In three pages, Paul talks about joy 16 times. So why is that so significant? Because this is a letter that the Apostle Paul, who is a prisoner, is writing while he's awaiting news, which may spell his death. In fact, you might better title this letter, Straight Out of Jail. <laughs> Paul was getting nowhere fast. He was getting nowhere slow either. In fact, he was getting nowhere. Let me tell you about these prisons. I did a little look into that. The prison that Paul was most likely in was probably a subterranean prison. Those were sunk about 12 feet underground. These prisons were filled with filth and darkness and stench. In fact, you were lowered into this prison through an opening about the size of a manhole, that was it. And that was the only way out and in for prisoner and guards and provisions. Animal waste, human waste, didn't get out of those holes very easily. Rain and debris from the market above as people walked by would easily drop down into that hole and stay in that house of darkness. Now, if I were in that hole, Here's the letter I would be writing. Dear Philippian family, I hardly know where to begin, and I'm finding it actually really difficult even to write. My head hurts, my body's sore and stiff. Ah, I wish I were anywhere but here. It's so lonely and cold and dark, and it stinks. I can move around maybe a little bit with these chains, but it's not easy and I can't go far. This is all so horrible, and I just want to get out. When will this end? Even more, how will this end? Death is imminent. I'm so absolutely scared and terrified about what, what may await me, and I'm not sure how much longer I can last without going absolutely crazy. God feels so far away and so absent. I pray, but no one seems to hear. Does he see me? Does he care? Can he even do anything about all of this? So that's my letter. Here's the opening part of the letter that Paul wrote from this underground stench house of a prison. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And he goes on. He says, what does it matter what people are saying about me and the gospel? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So my question is, how did he do it? 
How did he write this kind of stuff? When really it was a period of silence and emptiness and coming up blank. I mean, he was probably chained to the wall even though he was down in that hole. Maybe chained to a guard with just a few feet, if any, to move around or stand up if he was lucky. So when I was getting nowhere in my chapel preparation, I decided to stop and really look at what Paul did in a situation in which he was getting nowhere. So I want to share with you some of these insights that I saw. Now, I'm not gonna promise you a feel good, fix it all kind of message here. In fact, some of these principles that I saw might even seem a bit counterintuitive to what we often think about our Christian walk and journey. But you know, God seems to sometimes delight in the counterintuitive. So as I've studied this letter of Paul, looked at his response at the end of a very short rope, here's what I learned from Paul and how he did it. Number one, you walk as far as you can and then you stop. Sometimes just do it just doesn't. So Paul couldn't go anywhere, but at the end of his chains, Paul found brothers and sisters who could. When his rope stopped, the body of Christ picked it up. It says in Philippians 1, as Paul's talking to them, he said, you all share in God's grace with me. He said, you know, the brothers and sisters are now encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly because I'm at the end of my rope. Paul really technically had to say, I can't. I can't do anything right now. I can't go out and defend the gospel. I can't. Now, here's the counterintuitive part. Sometimes saying I can't may not be a cop-out. Sometimes saying I can't may actually give space for God to move in ways and through people we had never imagined. When I was first a mom, you see that my kids are grown, but when I had my first, when he was little, just a tiny baby, I remember throwing myself across the bed in my bedroom and saying, I wouldn't wish me as a mother on anyone. I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. I'm not doing it well. I can't do this. And then I felt a little tap on my shoulder. And it was my husband and he said, hello, there's a partnership here. Like, you are not doing this alone, what a concept. You know, there's a phrase tossed around a lot these days about leaning in. And leaning in's okay, but maybe leaning on is more important. Sometimes we hit situations, which I have, where I have to say to someone when I'm at the end of my rope, you know, I can't even pray about this anymore. I don't have it in me to pray. I don't even know what to pray. Sometimes it's, you know what, I can't talk to this particular person. I can't fix this, I can't make this happen. I can't go any faster or any further. Then you know what you do, you stop. You just stop and it's okay. I'm not sure we give each other enough permission every once in a while to say stop and then see who God has put at the end of that rope to take it the next step. You know, when I was growing up early in my years as a believer, there used to be the phrase that was told to us, God can't steer a parked car. So the implication was, I think you always gotta be moving, you need to be doing something, go in some direction, and then God will show you what to do. Well, there's a problem with that illustration because sometimes cars run out of battery, 
they run out of gas, and sometimes they're just stuck in traffic. And when you're stuck in traffic, you don't go pounding that car in front of you, much as we feel like doing that. I think there are times in our Christian journey when we're stuck. And maybe what we need to do in that moment is you just stay there. You just stop. Paul had to stop and find brothers and sisters at the end of his rope. Okay, number two. So you walk as far as you can, you stop. As you are stopped, when you are stopped, what do you do in that moment? Let me suggest, this may also be a bit counterintuitive, in those moments you focus less on the present and more on the past. Not just the past, but on past grace. Sometimes living in the past is the only reality you can trust in the present. In Philippians 1 here, Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. He's going back. He says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, going back. He says, I have you in my heart. You're there from past grace, past work, past partnership. And then he says, I long for all of you because I remember what we have. If God is silent in the now, may I suggest, perhaps, that you go back to when he wasn't. You dig deep, and then you hang on, and sometimes by sheer grit, if necessary, give thanks for what you have, and cling to what was, and what God showed you of himself when he was present to you even if you have no idea where strength or wisdom or resources for the next steps are going to come from. You know, there's a story about Corey Ten Boom, who when she was little, she was gonna take her very first train ride. And her father was getting ready to take her to the train and she said, give me my ticket, give me my ticket, I want my ticket. And he said, I will hold your ticket for you. Give me my ticket, give me my ticket. I will hold the ticket. When we get to the train and you need the ticket, I'll give it to you then. And when they got to the train, she's about to board the train, he said, now, here's the ticket. Sometimes God is saying to us, stop, wait, remember what I've done, Know that I was trustworthy in the past. I will give you the ticket when you need it in the present. Number three, you let go of looking good. Paul took no thought of his image or how he was being perceived or that he might be appearing weak and just rolling over and taking it. Maybe some thought, you know, Paul, you ought to be writing stronger letters. Blast those guards, blast those Romans, let them have it, what, what do you have to lose? And you know, in 2 Corinthians 12, seven through 10, Paul says that the Lord is saying to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul says here, in this first part of Philippians, he's saying to them as he writes, I want you to know that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Because of my chains, most of the brothers have stepped up. Some preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains, but what does it matter? The important thing is that Christ is preached. Paul is saying, it's really not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. I'm thinking, of course it's about me. You want to know what I was worried about in preparation for today? I want it to look good to you. I want to connect. I want to be engaging. I want to be funny, memorable, interesting. I want to give you something that will sustain you. I really want that. 
I want to look good to my colleagues and my peers. I want to be accurate and scholarly and smart. I want to look good to God. I want to be faithful. I want to be a living model of what I'm teaching. I want to find God to be as real to me as he was to Paul, but he wasn't. He was silent and distant while I was working on this, and I'm like, God, this isn't gonna look good. (laughs) You gotta give me something. You're silent and absent. And you know what I found? Finally, after you've kicked and you've fought for your ego and you've fought for looking good and you fought and were worried about what people will think, you let go and you simply say, okay, this is as good as it's gonna get. It's all I have. You bring your weakness to the table and serve it up. And finally, as you do that, you open your hands to get grace and nothing else. And then you say thank you. Charles Spurgeon said, there is no greater mercy that I know of on earth than good health, except it be sickness and that has often been a greater mercy to me than health. It is a good thing to be without a trouble, but it is a better thing to have trouble and know how to get grace enough to bear it. Know how to get grace enough to bear it. How did Paul get grace enough to bear it? Here's what I think. He walked as far as he could, and then he stopped. He forgot about now and what was ahead, and he was thankful for the then. He let go of looking good, and when you're done or done in, you open yourself to receive God's grace and his peace. So if I were to sum this up, you stop at the end of the rope, you look back, You give thanks for what you can, for where God was, and you let go. And then you taste and see that God is good in that moment. Ann Voskamp said, what if I gave thanks in the trouble for the trouble because the trouble is a gift that causes me to turn? What if I loved God not for his goods, but for his love itself? That is goodness enough. You know, as I was working on this, I'd get a few sentences and then I'd just stop. That was it. I'm like, okay, God, that's as far as I can go. That's it. I'm going to trust you'll walk me the next few steps. But right now, I'm at the end of my rope. I'll thank you for what you've given. I'll let it go. See what comes next. Did Paul, while he was down in that hole, Did he have some nights where he wondered if saying yes to following Jesus was really worth it? I've got to think he did. I've got to think there were moments when he wanted to give it all up, when God felt silent and absent. And at the end of that rope, he had to simply stop and say, this is all I have. God, I know you were there. I'm not sure what's ahead. I've got brothers and sisters right now who are at the end of my rope and I've got to lean on them. We're going to close uh, with a song that I've asked the worship team to lead us in. It's a song by Matt Redman called Never Once. I want to read some of the lyrics to you before we sing them says, standing on this mountaintop, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us, sometimes it's kneeling on a battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory, every victory was your power in us, scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, never once, Never once, never once did we ever walk alone.
you are faithful. God, you are faithful. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.